right, the defense may present its opening statement. May it please the court, uh, Mr. Frank and your team, Mr. Gray, Ms. Montgomery, former officer Potter <clears throat> and her family, her husband, sister-in-law and brother, members of the jury. <clears throat> she said, I'll tase you. I'll tase you. The language was direct, it was clear, it was unmistakable. And all Mr. Wright had to do was stop. He was told he was arrested on a warrant. He resisted, she said, I'll tase you. And all he had to do was surrender. But that wasn't his plan. <clears throat> he continued on with her struggle. And five seconds later, she says, taser, <clears throat> taser, taser. And you're going to remember those three words for the rest of your life. And when she's saying those three words, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have to know from the facts what she is seeing. Okay? Because what she is seeing is that her partner, Sergeant Johnson is in the car. He's a tall individual. He's going to testify probably tomorrow. But he's in the car restraining the gear shift so that Mr. Wright can't escape. And she knows that if he's not stopped, Mr. Wright's not stopped, He's about to drive away with a police officer dangling from his car. And she knows, and she'll tell you this, that when she says taser, 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 if she does nothing, if she does nothing, Mr. Wright drives away and either substantially harms Sergeant Johnson or more likely he kills them. So when she says, taser, 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 there's one last pause. The facts will show you. Mr. Wright can stop. All he has to do is stop, and he'd be with us. But he goes. She can't let him leave because he's going to kill her partner. And so she does taser, 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 and she pulls the trigger, believing that it was a taser. For why else would she say it? And immediately, upon pulling the trigger a single time, which is the training for tasers, the training for gun is to pull twice, she realizes what has happened much to her everlasting and unending regret. She made a mistake. This was an accident. She's a human being. But she had to do what she had to do to prevent a death to a fellow officer, too. Well, I, before I start on the facts, and <clears throat> there are quite a bit more details to this case than you just heard about over the last hour. I'd like to um, introduce myself once again. It's a, a great honor to be here. Um, it's a great privilege to be a lawyer in America, I think, and, and to be able to stand before you in this distinguished court in a case of this magnitude. And we are all about to engage in the great experiment that is called the American democracy, the central feature of which is a jury trial, where according to the Constitution, if a citizen is accused of crime, her peers get to decide what the facts are. 
and render a just verdict. It's humbling to be here, but a great honor to be her voice, along with Mr. Gray, to talk to you, to answer to the qu ask the question she wants us to ask, and to present the evidence she wants us to present for her, and to finally argue for her at the end of the case, which will be done by Mr. Gray. It's a historic process that we're all engaged in. And I know you'll appreciate it, but it's been going on for hundreds of years, to over 200 years, in the American effort to be fair. And there's something uh, sacred about what we're trying to accomplish here. You're making an everlasting decision about a human being. And there's hardly any greater responsibility <coughs> than that. Well, this is an opening statement. It's meant for <coughs> the defense and the state to give you a roadmap or an overview of the case. It's my chance to tell you what the facts are, many of which were left out. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do in the next half hour. I'm going to introduce the, the police officers to you because they're just not, <coughs> they're just not there for a, a second. They have lives. They have careers and you should know more about them. So I'll talk about Kimberly Potter and her life and her career. I'll talk about Sergeant Michael Johnson, and I'll talk about Anthony Lucky. I'll give you a, a, just an overview of what, who they are, which you should know about. Then <coughs> I'll follow that by talking about what happened here, you know, why he was arrested. This case isn't about a license tab. It's about a bench warrant and a guy that had a harassment order and violent conduct on his part. So we'll go in second by second on what happened here and what she saw, because she'll tell you that next week. But I want you to be in mind and mindful of what she saw. And then after we talk about the incident, I'll tell you about the other witnesses we're going to call to buttress and support our defense the experts and the lay witnesses alike, and then we'll be ready to go. So I want you to hang with me for a half hour here. That's where I'm going to go. So let's start with the three officers. Uh, well, first, Kimberly Potter. Uh, she's 49 years old. She was born in 1972. Four kids in her household. Um, she had one of these experiences as a kid that is memorable. One day in her grade school class, a police officer named <clears throat> Michael McGee came to talk about bicycle safety. And it is amazing what influence an adult might have on a child at any particular time, but she enjoyed the talk and it dawned on her that she might want to be a police officer. Just by the mere fact this officer came to her class. She pursued the interest in high school. She was in Explorers, which is kind of the, the teenager um, grouping that allows kids that age to, to, to experience police route work to see if they might be interested. And by the time she had graduated from high school, Totino Grace, by the way, which is in the northern suburbs, Catholic high school, maybe you are familiar with it, she had decided to be a police officer. And what she wanted to do was get a BA and then pursue her career. So she enrolled at St. Mary's University in Winona and started down there in 1990 and got a degree in criminal justice and sociology, which are the standard majors for police officers. She graduated in three and a half years. She was an industrious student, worked really hard. And then she started applying for work in the community. She got a job at the Anoka, Re Anoka Regional Treatment Facility, but she wanted to get in with the police force. So <clears throat> she applied and was hired in 1995 to work for Brooklyn Center Police Department as a patrol officer. And she'll tell you one of the proudest days of her life was to have her dad pin the badge on her so that she could be a, a police officer. Around the same time, she married her husband, Jeff, who's the, uh, the fellow with the <coughs> dark suit. Uh, and they have two kids. Uh, one, one's in the Marine Corps now. 
uh, and one plays the Division One hockey in the Dakotas, and they raise their family in the Champlin area. She started out her career as a patrol officer. She always wanted to be on the street. She took a special interest in uh, domestic abuse victims, which will come into play in a minute. <clears throat> she became a part of the Brooklyn Center Domestic Abuse Task Force. She was really interested in women who were victimized by men and uh, subject to the violence of men occasionally, and she shepherded <coughs> the women through the court system, <coughs> became their mentors, made sure they were treated fairly. She had a talent for negotiation. She was on the hostage negotiation team for Brooklyn Center. She was on the crisis team. She was an FTO, asked to be an FTO, which is <coughs> um, an honor as well to train police officers, and in this day, the, we're going to talk about in a moment, she was the FTO, field training officer. And one of her, pri her, her greatest achievements, she'll tell you, is that she is on the honor guard for police officers who die in the line of duty. She is the one among several who carry the caskets of police officers who are shot. Um, and every officer will tell you that the most dangerous thing a police officer will do is respond to a traffic stop or an act of domestic violence. And everybody that makes a stop knows that something may go wrong. So that's her, <coughs> that's her career. That's who she is. And over the course of 26 years, she never fired a gun. She never fired one shot. She never fired her taser. She never had to. She was good at de-escalating everything, and here that's what she's trying to do. I'll tase you, which is another way of saying, please stop, so I don't have to hurt you. Please stop. So that's who she is. She'll tell you that. Sergeant Johnson is on the scene. <coughs> He's 41. He started the force in 2005. He became a member of the SWAT team. And you'll see that he is an imposing guy, 6'2", 6'3". He's on the SWAT team because of his physicality. Uh, SWAT teams, he'll explain to you, go into houses to arrest people, uh, do search warrants, and are engaged in the um, activities in, uh, designed to arrest people who don't want to be arrested. And, Anything that's involving a dangerous uh, course of action, the SWAT team is often called. And he'll describe that to you. But the fact of the matter is, uh, SWAT team members tend to be fearless because they take the most risks. And on this day, he was the guy who opened the passenger car door and stayed in the car. And he was the guy that she wanted to save. So that's Sergeant Johnson. <clears throat> he's a patrol sergeant. He's her supervisor. He evaluates her. And he's on duty that day. He gets the radio call, and he arrives. Finally, we have Anthony Lucky, who is the young one of the bunch, but old in terms of experience. Uh, Mr. Lucky's in his 20. Officer Lucky's in his 20. He grew up in Brooklyn Park, which, of course, is next to Brooklyn Center. Graduated from high school there. He, too, will tell you that somewhere along the line when he was seven or eight, he decided to be a police officer. <clears throat> After high school, he went to uh, junior college for two years, Rasmussen, got certified. You need a two-year degree to be a police officer, four-year or two-year, and got his boards and um, started to become a police officer. He, his first job was up in Mille Lacs, uh, for the Mille Lacs Band, up in Mille Lacs Lake that the geography was a little tough. That's not quite where he wanted to be. He had a, a job in Gaylord, Minnesota, a small town north, south and west of here. And then he applied to where he always wanted to be, which was Brooklyn Center. And Brooklyn Center <coughs> was right next to where he lived. He knows the streets, he'll tell you. He knows the people. He knows the culture. He has intuitions about what is occurring because he grew up here. And in a sense, um, wait for him to testify as well. 
So those are the three people that really know what happened here. Let me go now into April 11th. On this day, Officer Lucky is supervised, as we said, by a former Officer Potter. They start the shift. It's a Sunday. It's non-eventful. Nothing is happening much on a Sunday in April in Brooklyn Center, but they're on routine patrol. An FTO supervises the new police officer. Officer Lucky just started in February of this year. <clears throat> and he's driving along and he sees a white GM Buick in a turn lane. The signals are opposite. Instead of turning left, there's a signal to turn right. His curiosity is piqued. He decides to follow the car. It's his decision. As he follows the car, he runs the plate. He notes that the tabs are expired. He sees a, a, a Christmas tree hanging from, the, from the, the, the mirror. But this case isn't about tabs. It's not about Christmas trees. He has a right to stop. He makes the decision. It's his own decision. She joins it, she doesn't oppose it, and he stops the car. And you're going to see a much longer video as we go through here. So he does what he's trained to do. <clears throat> he walks up to the car door, the window comes down. He immediately notices the odor of marijuana. They didn't tell you that last hour. He sees marijuana shake inside the car. He asked for a license. Mr. Wright, <coughs> excuse me, who is driving the car, has no license. He can't give him one. His license is suspended. He asked for insurance. Officer Lucky does, because in Minnesota, to drive a car, you've got to have insurance. And <coughs> the reason you have insurance is that should you get into a crash, that the victims of your crash can be compensated. And the only insurance card that Mr. Wright could produce was something four years old in a different name. So we've got some flags here going on. <clears throat> it's not anything about the tabs any longer. It's about someone who shouldn't be driving a car at all. Lucky goes back to the car. They get in. <clears throat> he runs a warrant check. Standard. There are different databases that can be used to run a warrants check. If you've ever stopped, this happens. This has happened to you as well. But <clears throat> um, so he runs a check, and you'll hear the audio of it. And there's a warrant for him. So this is this this changes the equation. The warrant is for a gun charge. A gun charge. It's a gross misdemeanor, and this causes Lucky, who lives in the area to be alarmed because he knows from his own personal experience from this area that a substantial percentage of people driving in Brooklyn Center have guns in their car. He'll estimate it's up to 40%. That may be high, but that's for his own anecdotal experience. But there's a substantial chance he'll tell you that there's now a gun in the car because the guy's got a gun warrant. And he'll tell you he thought there was a substantial chance <coughs> Wright had a gun either on his person or in the left container of the car in the doorway or in the console, which is where you hide the guns. Okay. He's alerted. So they, want, they run more checks, though. And what they didn't tell you an hour ago is there was a harassment order against Mr. Wright. Someone had, a female had, secured an order for protection against him because he had been violent against her. So we have guns. We have someone who's accused Mr. Wright of being violent and the court had ordered him to stay away from her. We have marijuana in the car. He can't drive the car away. He can't be allowed to leave. So Lucky goes back to the car and says, <coughs> they, have a, they have a conversation here. And the conclusion he drew was that he had to be arrested on the warrant. A court of law directed him to arrest him.
It has nothing to do with a, a license tab. It has to do with a court order from this district. So the plan is to go to the door and arrest them. But they also have to know who the female is in the car because Lucky knows, Officer, Fa, Porter, Officer Potter knows that with restraining orders and harassment orders, sometimes <coughs> the girlfriend or the friend who gets the order reconciles with the defendant. And they have to find out who she is to see if she is in danger. This is standard police work. No fault can be had for the strategy here. So Lucky walks up to the door, tells him Mr. Wright to get out. He can't arrest him inside the car. So he directs him to get out, and about the same time, all three of them say, You've got a, you're under arrest. And Johnson, by this time, has conferred. He knows what the situation is, too. So there's an arrest warrant for a gun. In hindsight, I suppose, they could have taken Mr. Wright further back. But all these officers will say that sometimes they arrest at the doorway. But the plan was to cuff him and then figure out what to do. They had to cuff him, recheck the warrant, recheck the woman, and then figure out what to do. This is all legitimate, <coughs> this is all legitimate police work. And all Mr. Wright had to do was surrender on the warrant, which he had to have known about. That's all he had to do. So <coughs> he gets him out of the car, Lucky does. And then you hear on the videotape, which you'll hear many times, is he, he, he turns <coughs> Dante right to the car, tries to get his arms back, which is what he's supposed to do, and then Wright starts to tense up. <coughs> and Lucky says, don't tense up. Don't tense up. Don't do it, bro, I think is the language that you'll hear. So we have someone who's <coughs> supposed to surrender and doesn't want to surrender. And he gets back in the car, and the, the, it's chaotic. It's fast moving. This, this is really quick. Mr. Wright is extremely fast. He knows exactly what he wants to do, and that is escape. So he twists and turns back in the car. <coughs> and at this point, Johnson enters the car. Johnson holds, as I say, the gear shift, so he can't drive. Lucky's trying to hang on. And at this point, he has to be stopped. He can't just drive away because <clears throat> the police officers know that fleeing a police officer is also a felony. And fleeing at a dangerous speed, which you saw on the video, is a dangerous felony. It's a crime of violence. They also know they can't let him go. They can't. The court has said, arrest him. I'll tase you, I'll tase you, I'll tase you, she says. It's clear, it's direct, it's rooted in her hostage crisis training. She announces what's going to happen to him. She hopes, as I tell you, that he will comply, be arrested. She, re she repeats it twice, I'll tase you, i tase you, and there's five seconds. <clears throat> and then as I told you, she sees Johnson, whose location was key to the case. Because if this guy drives away, he's dead. He's dead. So the moment, <clears throat> what happens, she shouts, taser, 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 and one of the issues for you, or the key issue in the case for you, is what was her conscious thought as to whether or not she had a taser in her arm or whether or not she had a gun. Can I to our, our the objection is overruled. The evidence will show you in her own testimony and in your intuition after watching the video 10 times is that she believed that she possessed a taser. 
That's why she said taser, taser, taser. She didn't say gun, gun, gun. <clears throat> and if she believed that she had a taser, which she did, then she did not have an awareness of possessing a gun. You know, the, 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 the crimes alleged here are going to be defined by Judge Chu at the end of the, of the trial, but it's just not shooting somebody. <clears throat> That's not the crime. It's being consciously aware of some kind of fact. Your Honor, it's time off. All right, Counselor, please stick to the facts. Okay. Well, as you look at the case, you decide whether <clears throat> when she said taser, 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 she meant something else. You decide. <clears throat> and that's why we're here, essentially. We have that dispute. So that takes care of the what happened. You know who the testimony is going to be. Now I want to tell you who our other witnesses are going to be before you, and then we'll get going on the case. We're going to call several witnesses. The first one will be Timothy Gannon. He's the police chief, former police chief of Brooklyn Center. He was um, starting at Brooklyn Center in 1994, about the same time officer, former Officer Potter did. He's, his <coughs> rise through the, excuse me, the department was um, a different course. He was on the SWAT team. He became a sergeant quite quickly. Uh, and then he became a commander. There are three commanders and then the police chief. And then eventually he became the police chief of Brooklyn Center. And he's going to testify first. He's a, a veteran of the Iraq wars. He's got a BA. Um, he's a wealth of experience. He's been in over 100 critical instances in his life where <clears throat> shots were fired. He's been in danger himself. And he'll testify about the, <clears throat> the training that Brooklyn Center police officers uh, take, and he'll testify that he's seen the videotape himself, uh, different views of the tape now as it become more produced in the discovery, and he'll say that the, given the position of <coughs> Johnson's body in the car, it was consistent with Officer Potter's training to not only shoot a, tra a taser, she certainly could do that, consistent with what she was trained to do, uh, but she could have also shot him, which is not intention, but she could have shot him, given the fact that Johnson almost died. But that will be his <coughs> testimony. He'll also tell you a little bit about being in these traumatic um, critical incidents, is what they're called in police, uh, police training and the police world. And he'll tell you that he's been in, as I say, 100. But he'll also tell you that there's certain um, inability to recall events that happen so quickly and they're so violent. Uh, and part of uh, Officer Potter's testimony will be a lack of recall as to some details in this. She's got most of them, but some details are gone. And that does happen during critical instances involving trauma. So he'll tell you a little bit more about that. We're going to call a, <coughs> next a, a fellow from Missouri named Steve Iams, I-J-A-M-S. He's a a 29-year veteran of police work, <coughs> and he's going to testify as to the reasonable use of a taser. There is a question here. They're going to present their own expert named Stoughton, and we will present an expert to you in the form of Iams, Steve Iams, that the use of the taser was certainly legitimate. It was appropriate. There was enough distance. The central <coughs> claim, uh, factual dispute that you're going to have to decide is whether the car was moving or whether in other words, Dante Wright was in control of the car. You know, the testimony will be that the car was not moving, that he wasn't in control of the car, and that was the purpose of Johnson being there. And you'll have testimony when someone says, taser, 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 that's consistent with the training, then everyone jumps back so as not to be shocked by the taser itself. So when, when Officer Potter shouted, taser, 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 that's when Johnson and Lucky moved back, and the fact that she shouted taser, taser, taser saved Johnson's life. So that's Steve Iams. He'll come in. We've got another officer named Colleen Fricky who uh, was with <coughs> uh, 
Kimberly Potter that night, and she'll show you a videotape to give you a sense of the profound remorse um, and the emotional impact this has had on her. Um, and she uh, she'll we'll show you a video of Kimberly Potter huddled in the corner of Brooklyn Center Police Station. Um, her grief and regret was inconsolable. But grief and regret is not a crime either, or reflective of one. We're going to call character witnesses for her, people who've known her, police officers, friends from the family, all ages to say that she has a good reputation for being peaceful and law-abiding, so that you know that this is <clears throat> something that is way out of the ordinary for her. And finally, we're going to ask her, answer the question that some of you had. <coughs> Uh, well, if you were a police officer for 29 years why, and trained so well, why should something like this happen? And so we will be calling a fellow named Lawrence Miller from Boca Raton, Florida. He's a PhD in psychology with an expertise in um, traumatic incident, uh, incidences and um, police work, violence. And he's going to talk to you about uh, how it is that we do one thing while meaning to do another. And it's called in the literature an action error. And he'll come in uh, Friday morning, a week from this Friday, and he'll talk about <laughs> the routine kind of action errors that we all <clears throat> experience. He'll uh, you know, give you some examples of what, uh, what an action error is, but I want to uh, get that word in your mind as you go through the case, action error. And uh, for example, uh, you know, as the year turns, and for those who still write checks, um, you write the date of the, the check in January and you put the wrong year because you're used to doing 2001 all through the year and it should be 2022. Well, that's an error. You're, you're, you're making an error you don't even think about. Or in computers, you change the password but absentmindedly go back to your old password. Or if you've recently moved to a different location, <coughs> you sometimes can drive back to your old location not realizing that that's what you've done. These are called action errors, and they are, <coughs> they are ordinarily dismissible, but they become quite important when what happens is catastrophic. And when, <coughs> when someone uh, makes a mistake <coughs> and wants to do one thing but does something else with consequences uh, of the kind that we see here. You know, action errors in, in the field of great catastrophe include airline mistakes that are historically made, <clears throat> why a high-time pilot would suddenly miss a landing after 30 years, why a surgeon perhaps after a thousand surgeries might make a mistake, which can happen, or a diagnosis may be missed in the time of stress. Action errors in police work, Dr. Miller will tell you, occur in times of <clears throat> chaos, acute stress, when the decisions have to be made in an instant, when there is no time for reflection, and where the, <clears throat> where the individual involved is in turn chaotic and perhaps intoxicated. Stoned is another word for it. It's up to you, of course, whether action error occurred in this case, and he's not going to give you an opinion one way or another, but he'll explain what happens to the brain and what happens in these high catastrophic instances is that the habits <coughs> that are ingrained, the training that's ingrained, takes over in these chaotic situations and the historic training is applied and the newer training <coughs> is discounted and the evidence in this case is that the tasers that were only available in the last 10 years, and this is a brand new taser, whereas by comparison, Ms. Potter has had 26 years of gun training. And an error can happen. We are in a human business. Police officers are human beings. And that's what occurred. At the conclusion of the case, I will rest and we'll get a chance to argue for what the facts show. And that will be an argument 
for your verdict of not guilty. Ms. Potter's good name has been besmirched by this allegation, which is not true, and by the press coverage, which has been slanted, and we seek to reclaim it. And reclaim it we will. And our request for you to find her not guilty will, will be well deserved. Thank you.